Thank you, Minister. And we now have time for questions. Uh, the same rules as before apply. I will uh, ask the first minister because he opened the door wide open to this one. So I'll take up that invitation. How important is it that policy in this area be evidence-based and ask particularly about the drug testing trial because isn't the evidence from countries that have introduced it, say Britain, Canada and New Zealand, that it doesn't work and it's very costly and wasn't there a document that I think came up on BuzzFeed this morning that said a recommendation from the National Council on Drugs in 2011 said exactly that. It, it doesn't work and it is expensive. Uh, yeah, so one thing I can say is if you want evidence, don't go to BuzzFeed. But um, <laughs> look, it hasn't been run in Britain. It's been run in New Zealand and I think 14 or 15 states in the United States. None of them that we're aware of have run their own internal evaluations and we will do that. So we've set aside a specific amount of money to run the internal evaluation. Um, for instance, in America, one thing that's clear amongst the trials of drug testing is that the cohort of individuals in the welfare systems where testing was applied have lower rates of drug use based on the testing than the wider population. Critics of drug testing say that is evidence of failure, supporters say it's evidence of success. So there is a lot of ancillary data out there that suggests both that there's a problem and that there is a clear way in which drug testing can help that problem. So a person who is unemployed is, based on good data, 2.4 times more likely to have addictive issues with drugs and alcohol. Now, obviously, that there's both cause and effect in there. But we know absolutely for certain that large numbers of people in the welfare system have barriers to employment which are caused by drug and alcohol problems. I also know, as a matter of fact, that at the moment we are not doing anywhere near enough to first identify them and secondly assist them. What the drug testing trial is about is nothing to do with being punitive. On a first test, uh, the response will be income management through a card technology. The idea being that we are trying to engender behavioural change. Behavioural change may be caused, as seems to be evidenced in the United States, by the mere fact of the drug testing policy itself, that people will restrain or refrain to the extent that they can in drug use during those critical months where they're trying to get a job. Then if they do test positive, uh, the income management through card technology will allow us to limit the amount of cash available to underpin what is the underlying cause of the problem. A second positive test will result in the person being assessed by a medical professional that we through human services will allocate, pay for and fund and design a system of rehabilitation and recovery. And the obligation of the person who might test positive in those circumstances will be to undertake and abide by that plan. And that, we think, is an approach which is far superior to just accepting an excuse or an exemption and leaving the person to their own devices. And that's what we do at the moment. But it is a trial. We'll evaluate it very carefully. But this notion that there's simply no evidence that there is changed behaviour when you run drug testing in these types of settings inside welfare systems, just actually not correct. But there will be supporters and detractors of this policy and they will use evidence that does exist to either say that it's a positive or a negative thing. But and we will run our own evaluation trial. And will you make that evaluation public? Oh, of course, yeah. On to other questions. Yeah, Mark Goldstone, CEO, City of Adelaide. I'm interested in your views on um, rough sleepers in our cities. Um, visit any of our capital cities and it's really obvious that there's a, a problem, a growing problem with people rough sleeping in the CBD areas of our cities and um, the problem is, is, is very significant and is clearly a system of failure of some kind. Multifaceted, I understand, and very complex. What is the, the, the response the federal government is taking to this growing problem? So as, as you note, I mean, there's a coalescence of multiple causes of rough, rough sleeping. And it is a very challenging problem that goes across civil society, state and federal government and every imaginable type of service delivery. So we are a part of developing the appropriate solutions to impact on that problem. One of the things that we have done that was very significant in this budget is that the National Agreement on Housing Affordability and the National Partnership on Homelessness have basically been, um, particularly the second one, the Partnership on Homelessness, has been a, a a grant system from the Commonwealth to the states, which I might add I think has worked very well, 
but which has only ever been renewed on very short-term bases. And that's caused a whole range of problems inside that sector because there's no continuity of employment. There are always difficulties in keeping staff who are delivering fantastic services. This government has made that, in effect, permanent with an up inflationary uplift. So we have guaranteed the ongoing funding for the National Partnership Against Homelessness. Um, and we will also put that funding together with the, with the NAHA, the Housing Affordability Agreement, and renegotiate with the state so that we have absolutely clearer line of sight and KPIs, KPIs and measurable outcomes, particularly around the number of unit dwellings that are actually being built through what is effectively a public subsidy scheme. So that's, I mean, that is a very central part of the Commonwealth Government response, is to look at those things that are working like the NPAR, actually fund it properly and continuously with, with an appropriate uplift for representing inflation, uh, and also to make sure with things like the housing affordability agreements that we're getting value for the taxpayers' money and building the units that we expect to be built. Next question. Um, David Haviot from Energy Consumers Australia, but, but my question's got nothing to do with my employment. Um, in your peroration, you, you, I think you said work is a sacred form of giving and suggested that uh, just the economic analysis wasn't the reason why you should think about whether people will work. That seems to conflict with the position you take at the top end of the scale where supposedly a 2% levy on high income earners is a huge disincentive to work. So why is it that the incentives to work are different or should be different between the bottom end of the income scale and the top end of the income scale? And secondly, um, Drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs are not cheap. They're not simply things organised by a doctor. How much money are you really prepared to put into drug and alcohol rehabilitation to actually make a difference? So with respect to your first question, I think you're conflating um, incentives to work with the, the um, inherent want to work and the moral value and um, human desire to work. I mean, different incentives economically exist to work in different tax systems. What I'm talking about is the fact that whether you are earning a million dollars or $38,000, your life is enriched by work. And as to the point that um, there's some failure or, or fundamental unfairness about the Australian tax system, the top 1% of income taxpayers pay 17% of all income tax in Australia and the top 10% pay, pay close to half. So we do have, as things presently stand, a very, very progressive income tax system. And I think that that income tax system is fair. This is why we have proposed the 0.5% increase in the Medicare levy to fully fund the final gap in funding for the NDIS. Because at the very lower end of the Medicare system, which itself has carve outs for very low income earners, you will pay much, much less than someone at the very high end. So a person who is on an income of $200,000 might have seven times more the income of a person who's on an income of um, 37,000, but they'll pay 14 times more of the Medicare levy. So I think that the structures inside the system are not really open to criticisms of unfairness, and that's why we've designed the 0.5% levy. But I just, the proposition that I'm putting is just that at some points in time in our system, you can earn as much from a collection of welfare payments as you can from work. But that is just a fact of the system. The proposition I'm putting out is that you are much better if you are earning the same amount through work than if you are earning the same amount passively, and I use the word earning loosely, but if you are receiving the same amount passively through welfare payments. And the second question about the cost of or putting money into drug and well, alcohol rehabilitation. I, I must say that the $600 million that we devoted last year to precise this issue is not an insignificant amount of money. But with respect to the drug testing trials, we will have three trial locations, and those locations will be chosen on a number of criteria, but one of those criteria will be that we are assured that there are treatment options available for the people who might be subject to that second positive test. One thing I would keep in mind, though, is that with drug and alcohol problems, what the research shows is that most people have in their mind that the answer to a drug and alcohol problem in terms of treatment is residential rehabilitation services. 40% of all of the medical responses to drug and alcohol problems are actually counselling, 40%. But what we will do is choose trial locations to make sure that there are available services and we're not going to require people to do things where there's not an availability of the thing that's been prescribed as the appropriate response for them. And there's another question in the middle. 
Um, Minister Jackie Kelly from Lutheran Services, and thank you for your great insight into your reform agendas. Um, you've mentioned, it, uh, well, separately, and in addition to drug and alcohol problems, there are, you know, we can encounter in our line of work a number of um, groups, like, for example, you've mentioned men over 55. Um, we see women uh, who are on their own for for reasons of divorce or. Um, um, or, or um, loss of a spouse or partner, um, and women and women escaping domestic violence and trying to rebuild their lives who may not have had, um, you know, the opportunity to develop uh, skills earlier on in their life. Um, and so these problems are often complex and cross-portfolio or require a cross-portfolio solution. I'm just wondering if you could comment on um, some of the um, ideas or initiatives that that your department's thinking about uh, in relation to some of these particular groups of people who have quite um, complex, where the problem is sure. quite complex. So what we did last year with our Try Test Learn Fund is we platformed all of the information, the data we had available in social services for the last 10 years and built a quite sophisticated model set. So we can look at, with great granularity at groups just like the ones that you've spoken about and work out exactly which groups have the the poorest outcomes, the worst trajectories through the social security system. So the initial application of our $100 million in the Tri-Test Learn Fund was for three groups. Admittedly, these are groups that are essentially groups of younger people, but the three groups of younger people that had the worst outcomes were essentially um, welfare recipients who have children under the age of 18, um, young students who failed their studies and gone on to Newstart, and young carers. And what we found is that if you happen to be inside one of those groups when you're between 16 and 22, statistically, you are almost guaranteed to have a very, very long period of time inside the welfare system. And particularly with the group of young mothers, you will transmit welfare dependency of a similar type to the tune of 80% to your children. So with the Try Test Learn Fund, and again, a not insignificant amount of money, what we've said is using that data platform that we spent $33 million developing, we've gone to the NGOs, to commercial firms, anyone who wants to make an application can design a program, a policy, an approach for one of either or all of those three groups. And we will pay them to undertake that. And we will measure that program with our best data to see whether or not you're making improvements in terms of wellbeing measured through employment against an average. If it does well, we'll keep funding. If it doesn't, we will move on and fund something else. Then, in addition to that 100 million, I've noted 260 million. This is a quarter of a billion dollars devoted to young parents. Um, very significant amounts of money also for reskilling mature age workers in this budget. So, we are making sure that running parallel to this structural change, there are sufficient and significant increases in, in resources allocated to precisely the groups that we know, based on data that, again, we've spent a lot of taxpayers' money putting together, have difficulties in the system. But perhaps if I end this answer by saying that, at the moment, the observation I would offer is that the worst possible situation is to let persist a system where someone between the ages of 55 and 59, which is not old, does not have any substantial requirement under the welfare system to look, look for a job. Like the one guaranteed way to ensure low rates of achieving employment for that group is not to require anything by way of mutual obligation and job search from that group. Like it's, it's just the fundamentally wrong starting position which we're changing. All of the reasonable excuse provisions of which there are many, the ways in which you can get exemptions if there's domestic violence or there are medical problems, they all still exist in the system. Uh, that you know, operates relatively well. So we want to have a flexible system as well as a system that has consistent, coherent mutual obligations that we actually enforce. Any other question down here? Yeah. We'll just wait for the microphone to come to you. Thanks. Sam Walker from Lutheran Services at all. I promise it's not planned. Um, where are the employers in some of this? Because I think you're absolutely right. There are demonstrated benefits of work beyond just remuneration. But there is also a well understood, very specific type of psychic pain caused by exploitative work. And obviously, 
there are people who are more vulnerable to that than others, not necessarily even through employers of bad intention. Um, things specifically of workers with a disability where, you know, support for employers to modify expectations, conditions and that sort of thing leads to longer and better quality forms of employment for workers with disability and I'm just wondering sort of moving away from job seekers themselves but onto the other side uh, where, where the employers are in this conversation. Yep. Well, I mean, you would have noted that this budget also um, contained a very fundamental reform, reform of disability employment services and again properly funding it and noting that it hadn't been indexed for increasing costs in the past and we're now doing that. Also fundamental changes to the structure of disability employment service providers contracts so that you don't have this situation where there are just rolling five year contracts where no one else can offer a service in an area and the results under the system that we're now replacing have not been anywhere near as good as, as we would expect. So yes, you have to take great care and diligence both in assisting people to find the job, but also ensuring that they're staying in a job. And again, with disability employment services, there was, in my observation, under all the relevant contracts, too much upfront payment and a not enough remuneration for the, for the service provider for actually having someone in a job at markers at three, six, nine months out. It's the permanence of the job. And again, looking at those statistics that 23% of people move off um, move off New Start inside three months, what it shows is that there are jobs that people can move to. What is difficult is matching people with jobs that yeah. they have longevity to. So I, I accept that point. And that's about us as a government, through redesigning compliance, getting to understand people's individual circumstances better and refining the interface with all the job active providers. But equally, I, I just would offer this, that the reality is that there are pockets of geographical parts of Australia where there is both high youth unemployment and jobs that we cannot fill. So in the next two years, with the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, there will be 60,000 new FTE jobs created in disability care. And at the same time, one of the highest rates of unemployment is amongst people who have been in a relationship where they have been paid to be a carer, who have been on carer's allowance, carer's payment, and that relationship ends and they go on to new start. Now, if we are persisting with the fundamental structure of a system that can't manage to match people who have experience in care with good, well remunerated, meaningful jobs in disability care, then the structures we've been running so far need significant improvement. And that's, that is very much the aim. So I think that we're in agreement that it, it is needed to acknowledge some of the difficulties and nuances in getting people into jobs that they stay in. And, and is the answer to that particular problem finding a way to get uh, qualifications for those who have been carers that maybe recognise their previous experience? Uh, well, absolutely. And so look at what um, Peter Dutton has done in his portfolio in terms of ensuring that there's an appropriate amount put into a training fund that is in effect garnered by by the system of bringing in workers on visas to fill employment positions here. I think it's 1.8 billion from recollection. I mean, this is a very significant um, investment. And yes, there's a sort of triangulation here between what happens in the welfare system uh, and at the other end of that, what happens in terms of your ability to train young people. And of course, at the top, there's the job market. And you have to have all those three things working in concert. But we are creating jobs inside Australia um, in new areas like disability care, aged care, childcare, in those three areas, out to 2020, there'll be 100,000 new jobs. Any other questions? I, I do have one more, and recognising that part of CEDA's <coughs> role is to improve public discourse. You gave some numbers which suggest that for the majority of people, particularly those seeking work, the, the system is actually working. Do you think it would be better there would be more confidence in the system both from those who need it and those who pay from it if there was more discussion about the successes of the system rather than, and I acknowledge that as a member of the media we have to take some responsibility mm -hmm. for this, rather than boiling it down to dole bludgers and welfare cheats? Well, I'm, I'm out there encouraging all of my friends in the media to report successes with prominence in paper and on the TV news and that's not always something that happens. 
but uh, I mean, as I said, what I see in this system is what engineers would call cascading failure. Um, there are enough parts of the system failing badly enough to put pressure on the entirety of the system that you have to act. Uh, but as I say, for many people inside the system, the system works tolerably well. But what we need to do is fix those parts of the system that fail for individuals that we know have barriers to employment, that have challenges. And equally, we cannot turn a blind eye to the fact that there are people gaming the system. I mean, what we've seen when we uncover the, the clear data is that there are very sharp practices in the system from people that we've identified as having no barriers to employment. Many of them may actually be working, just not declaring that income. And we have to close down those loopholes in the system. And that's what gives public confidence in the system. So I think this is about building public confidence that the system is as good as a complicated system can be. And one final question. Given you are dealing with vulnerable people, how confident are you that the system does not take money away? And we have been talking about very large numbers, billions of dollars, but I'm talking about 10 or $20 a week that people need to pay, help pay rent and food. How confident are you that the system does not take money away from those people who really need it to survive? Well, um, the, this is very large overarching reform. Seven payments become one payment. We totally redraft to make consistent and coherent people's mutual obligations to search for work and we totally rewrite the compliance regime. But we've been very careful inside that to make sure that, and I think the figure is about 99.9 something percent of people don't lose any money. Their payment structure stays the same. So we've been very careful to make sure that this is structural reform meant to increase people's chances of employment but doesn't affect their payment rates. But I guess I might leave you with maybe the better answer to your previous question, which is that if you let a system go on, so my, my um, Human Services Minister, Alan Tudge, has done an enormous amount of work in debt recovery. Um, you would have seen in the paper yesterday or the day before that we've uncovered circumstances where people have been earning through childcare $240,000 a year and reporting their income to Centrelink as zero. Now, if any government lets a system like that persist, <coughs> we will lose public confidence in the system. So you have to try and find those excesses and close them down, um, because otherwise the result is a loss of confidence. Minister, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you please thank Minister Porter? <laughs>